So, what was it like for me to be sick? One thing I was anxious about then, when I was in high school, uh, I was tense. My muscles were tense all the time. Uh, I had, uh, I couldn't sleep. I had a lot of stomach problems. Uh, in actual fact, on more than one occasion, I drank a glass of milk and it gave me heartburn. Sleep difficulties, stomach problems, low self-esteem. You know, it's kind of a, a, a funny thing, you know, when I was in school, I got good grades. And it's not that I didn't have friends, it's just that I couldn't initiate friendship because of this low self-esteem thing. I, I never went on a single date in high school because the fear of somebody saying, no, I don't think so, was so huge for me, I couldn't ask someone. Um, people, when I was in high school, I was involved in, in uh, plays and choir and in some solo singing. I, I uh, just kind of made a little reputation as an artist for a while. And people said all kinds of complimentary things to me, and I didn't believe a single one. Why? Because I knew what I was really like. That's low self-esteem. And so then, when people come along and say, oh, that's really good what you did there, you think, well, yeah, okay, well, what do you want from me now? I was unable to initiate relationships. And then, I discovered that everything can be fixed. If you just, you know, got a buzz on because alcohol is a fabulous anti-anxiety medication. So I'm not going to take a poll here of how many people at some point in their life said, no, I'm not going to dance yet, I need another drink or two. <laughs> but I can tell that I'm not the only one. Right? So, you know, then I could go places and, you know, have a few and it's great. This is, this is the best stuff ever. Uh, the only problem with that is, uh, you know, like so many things in life, a little might be good, but a lot, and it's not necessarily a good, a good deal. So I was unable to get my needs met, basically. And this is what happens is you get stuck, like I got stuck, and then you can't, on your own, you can't get unstuck, basically, because it inhibits your ability to get your needs met. So, um, some years ago, uh, I was asked by Becky Rand, who uh, is one of the CD counselors at Woodland Centers, who incidentally is the person that did my CD of L 20 years ago, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, she asked me to speak at the, to have a little graduation ceremony for the, the people on the CD program. And uh, talk about, you know, what was, to what do you attribute your successful recovery? My belief in a higher power, I don't tell you how it works. When you are, because being mentally ill is really lonely, first of all. Because what you have done is constructed walls around yourself that you cannot break through. So when you're sitting there at rock bottom, that's when you realize that you're not sitting there alone. So I did some thinking, and I thought, well, you know, I just can't believe in this uh, vengeful God theory. You know, maybe, maybe the, uh, the way it really works is that we make ourselves miserable, and maybe the higher power will help us when we start making better decisions. And it actually works that way. Um, 
So, next thing that happened to me is, I, coincidentally, I'm going to use that term because personally I believe there are no coincidences, but uh, things sort of appear. You know, it's like that old saying, uh, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Well, I was ready to hear what this guy, Jeff Slayer, had to say in his book. I ain't much baby, but I'm all I got. Um, well, he talked about the need for emotional intimacy. I, I'm going to use this blackboard over here. Um, he talked about how essential for our survival is emotional intimacy. So, um, this is you, and this is me. Okay? And what we do is we construct around ourselves layers of defenses. And I'm just going to draw a couple here, but really kind of an infinite number. Now, most of the time, this is what we present to the outside world, is this outer layer. Um, and so this is how most people see you. Now, one of my clients gave me the perfect example of this the other day in group, in which he had been on a pass because one of his relatives was on her deathbed, apparently. And so he was staying with some relatives that he didn't know well, and he was with his parents and so forth. And he said, you know, I mean, this guy's got all kinds of problems. He's a... Has, numerous children of his own and his, you know his wife uh, is a little reluctant about letting him come home and so on and so forth and there's you know some chemical use and so forth so for some reason he decided that he was going to share something at a little bit deeper level and he was going to say how he really was because you know people say how are you doing and we all say oh great that's this layer right here. Well, you know, he's not doing great because he's in a treatment program for a reason. It's not an accident that he was there. So he tells her this. Well, you know, much to everyone's amazement, she shared something with him. That was kind of a sensitive thing. I don't know if you've read the papers, but you know, last week in Atwater, uh, one of our residents stepped in front of a train, uh, killed herself, and he shared about that with this person that he vaguely knew. Well, then she shared that some years ago her son had committed suicide. And they talked about that. And they said, he's telling me about it, and they said, well, do you know, how, how did that work out for you? How did you feel when you got that? He said, I felt really good. I felt close to her. Now, and we'll, we'll get to talk more about acceptance later, but uh, this, this relationship right here, this interaction, is the basis of the therapeutic relationship. It is the basis of recovery. You can't recover until you are willing to do that. So why is it that people don't do it? You get hurt. You are risking someone being judgmental on you. And how does that feel? So, um, so that's why anyway. And, and he talks about all this in there. And so I started looking for people that I could share with, that maybe I could get some acceptance back. Because if they're not being judgmental, then they're being accepting, right? And I wasn't really good at it at first, but I viewed it as a matter of life and death, and it is, as attested to by the person that stepped in front of the train last week, it is a matter of life and death. 
So I thought, well, I can do something that's really, really, really hard or eventually it's going to kill me. And admittedly, I wasn't good at picking people to do that with. And, and sometimes, sometimes I had to use my anti-anxiety medication in a bottle to do it. But I got better because guess what? It's a skill. When you practice it, you get better. Um, and what Jess Lear says is, it's the unconditional acceptance and love that does the healing. Now there's a number of sources out there that will say um, that there is a natural healing process, and I have to agree with that, but you have to provide the proper conditions. It's, we're growing as an organism, let's say, and it's just like a plant if you give it the right soil and the right, right water and the right uh, sunlight, it's going to grow. You give a human, uh, human being the right stuff, unconditional love and acceptance, we're going to grow. Ah, uh, yes. Transcendental meditation. Well, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, one of my chief symptoms was I was tense all the time. I go to bed at night, I'm grinding my teeth, and it gives me a headache because I grind my teeth too long. And, and if you're grinding your teeth and you're that tense, you can't sleep. So I start reading about stress. So it's, to me, it's an interesting thing that, you know, I've talked to hundreds of people over the years who were uh, involved in my program. A lot of people will say, no, I don't have a mental illness. But virtually every one of those people that says that will say, but I'm really stressed out. It's sort of become, it's okay to be stressed out, because everybody's stressed out, but if I have a mental illness, then obviously, you know, I'm wrong with me. So that was me, I was really stressed out. <laughs> And I'm tense. So I start reading about some, uh, there's a, a, another book, uh, they did some groundbreaking uh, uh, work in stress management. Uh, Sealing, I think his name is. Uh, and he talked about this uh, deep relaxation response that happens with transcendental meditation. So, you know, I did some research and a few coincidences later, <coughs> I'm in tran transcendental meditation class. And this organization, by the way, is one of the people who say that there is a natural uh, healing process that takes place if you provide the proper conditions. And what they were talking about is this deep relaxation response. And, and of course, uh, uh, this is the organization that the Maharishi started, and, you know, the Beatles guru. Just looking around the room, I know that some of you people know who that. Talking about. Uh, so after I start, you know, they give you a mantra and, and, and you know, you sit quietly for 20 minutes and chant this mantra to yourself. But guess what? It works. You go into a deeply relaxed state. My sleep improved. I became less tense. Uh, and for a while I thought, this is, this is it. This is the ultimate, you know, I'm here now. Now I can be normal. Uh, but uh, the nature of things is that the universe sort of presents us with these little challenges that make us grow, and then once you get past that, well, guess what? There's there's another one. 